stories don't define you. How you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief storymaker at Elkins Consulting. In my work with coaching clients, I guide people to improve their communication using storytelling as the foundation of our work together. What I've realized over years of coaching and podcasting is that the majority of people don't realize the impact of the stories they share on their internal messages and on the people they're sharing them with. My work with leaders and people who aspire to be leaders follows a similar path to the interviews on my podcast, uncovering pivotal moments in their lives and learning how to share them to connect more authentically with others, to make their presentations and speaking more engaging, to reveal patterns that have kept them stuck or moved them forward, and to improve their relationships at work and at home. When you're ready to get started collecting your own stories, my book, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, is available in all the regular places, and the audiobook version is now available on Google Play and on my website, elkinsconsulting.com. As a special bonus for listeners, the audiobook includes two songs recorded by my band, Spare Change, in my living room in Montana. Keep an eye out for announcements through LinkedIn and via my Elkins Consulting Facebook and Instagram pages, or visit my website, elkinsconsulting.com, to learn more. Also on my website is a free podcast interview checklist. It's available to download to make sure you make the most of your next podcast interview. Welcome to Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, J.D. Gershbein. I am so happy to be visiting with you today. As you uh, mentioned right before we got started, it is New Year's Eve day that we're recording this episode. And um, so I'm sure that that will play a part in our casual, rather informal conversation. So thank you for joining me today, JD. Happy New Year. May I be among the first to wish you a happy New Year. So um, I I will ask you a little bit about what you do, just so that people have an idea, the listeners will have an idea of what you do. But I would prefer to get started with the question that I always ask my guests, which is, okay. will you please share something about yourself? Most of it's not on your LinkedIn profile, I've really talked a lot about. Um, what do you think? Can you answer that one for me? You know, it's interesting. I've actually been asked that question a few times, Sarah, and it's, it's probably going to be mainstream pretty soon. So I might have to change up my answer because... <laughs> <laughs> what what people didn't know about me, they know about me now because I've expressed it. But uh, what one of the things that you couldn't possibly know about me is that I was groomed to become a physician at a very early age and was exposed to a lot of opportunities with my father, who was a very dedicated man of medicine. And is a great opportunity that any medical student would have loved to have had anybody kind of headed in that career direction. I assisted on autopsies when I was 16 years old. So I've actually sewn up a human body by myself in the room when I was 16 years old. Wow. That's not something you bring out at family reunions, is it? (laughs) Well, maybe you do if you really aren't that excited about being there and you want to stir things up a little bit. It was a great experience, actually. And like I said, I was in that kind of mindset growing up. And and that really kind of gets us off and running with the so-called storytelling piece. And in that I was groomed to be a physician, I had been exposed to all areas of medicine as as a kid and got to work in a hospital when I was 14 years old and was exposed to all areas of, of medicine and hospital life. So I was, I was really born into that profession, but I didn't wind up completing a medical school. I, I did get in uh, and was not part of dad's master plan. So. Oh. so what happened in medical school? Did you actually go after you were accepted or did you decide before you even started the program that it wasn't your path? I guess I was convinced that I really wanted it. And my father had oriented me toward that. I was really more focused on becoming a broadcaster, going into communications arts. Um, I was on a radio station in high school. I really liked the whole creative uh, outlet uh, that I had. And when I studied, I studied hard. I didn't have the grades to get into medical school, but I was determined to get in uh, and took the MCATs. Didn't do well the first time. Actually had strep throat the first time I took them. Went back, persevered, took the, the Kaplan course, which is the primer to get better grades on all of these admissions tests. 
and actually did well enough to impress the scouts and guide into medical school. And after uh, just shy of one year, I said, this is not for me. This is, this is dad's dream, not mine. So I just willfully up and left. Wow. That is quite a change going How about to it? that prep and then not doing it. That Wow. What did your dad say? Well, let's just say that it was a point of contention from that point on. And uh, I was able to reconcile things with him to a certain point and uh, just letting him know that uh, as, as a parent, I, it's important to have a plan B for your kids. I, I learned from the, or from the situation, not to pressurize my kids into doing anything they didn't want to do or anything that I felt would make them live up to my expectations and not theirs. I just, whatever they chose, I wanted them to be happy. And, and that wasn't really the case for me because there was no plan B. I, I was geared toward this, this preset field kind of massaged and finessed in that direction. And uh, that was kind of like my coming of age and, and my rite of passage was to just tell him, Hey, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I've, I've emerged with a good sense of what it's like to be a healer and what it's like to be in the profession, but uh, it wasn't for me. So what was it, do you think, in school? Was there a particular moment? Was it um, a, another teacher, another student, a, a competitive experience that really made you like go, oh, well, I already knew I didn't like this, but now I really know I don't want this. Well, they say that in medicine, a mistake can be a life or death decision. And I guess deep down, I, I wasn't comfortable with the idea that there was no room for error and that if I made a mistake, that there was life in the balance. And that was a, an immense amount of pressure. And I really wasn't there for the right reasons. I, I guess that even after convincing myself I wanted to become a physician, it wasn't in the cards for me. I, I didn't have the the hardwiring or, or the metal to withstand the, the rigors of the profession. And when I talk to doctors today, uh, they're, in essence, many of them are, are just uh, W-2 employees in a huge corporation, much like anyone else. Medicine has become a job and you really have to go into, into medicine for the right reasons. You have to truly be focused on healing ills and and understanding the pressures and the demands and the commitments of the profession. That is something that I know to be true as well. My mom um, went back to school. She had had her bachelor's degree in education. And then um, when we were three teenagers and she was almost 40, she was like 37, 38. She said, I've always wanted to be a nurse. That's mm -hmm. my calling. And she went back to school, graduated summa cum laude with her four-year RN degree in wow. her early forties with three teenagers at home. And, um, and for almost 30 years, that's what she did. And she loved every minute of it. I mean, there were, are there challenges of course, but um, her biggest challenges had nothing to do with decisions she had to make or that feeling of the life or death situations. It was the administration. It mm -hmm. was, changing software products again and having mm. to learn new stuff. And because she is pretty savvy and very quick, she would learn it fastest. And so they would give her the role of training other nurses. Um, and so those were her challenges far more than anything related to the actual medical practice that she was doing. And you said a key word before, Sarah, you said the word calling, and I never felt that it was my calling. Had I felt that, I would have never looked back. I would have been able to uh, allay my fears and doubts about the trade. I would have gone in headstrong with the ability that I was here to, 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 to serve unhealthy people and, and correct biological problems and do research and become a, a, a very dedicated practitioner uh, serving patients. And I, I guess it just never took hold for me that way. And that's okay. That's not a, that's not a bad thing. Look, I'm glad I realized it. Why be miserable in a field that you're not cut out for emotionally or, 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 or physically. I mean, right. if you Completely. can't handle it, get the hell out of there, man. Absolutely. It's like teachers that go into mm -hmm. teaching for the wrong reasons and then they're miserable and they make their students mm -hmm. miserable and they're not particularly effective. And um, I, I feel the same way. If, if, if it's not something that 
inspires you, especially when it comes to influencing young minds in education Mm -hmm. or somebody's health and well-being. Those are areas that are just hugely impactful. But I don't know about you, but I hardly know anyone that really knew what that calling was until they were in their 30s or older. Like I was in my 40s before I started to realize what my true talents were and started to to use them with intention. I had to wait for social media to come along to, sh- <laughs> to, to show me. I mean, when the social media revolution hit, I was confronted directly and very impactfully with my so-called value proposition. I, I knew what I was cut out to do. And I, I looked at it as, okay, this is a field that will enable me to use everything for which I've been trained and including my, my temperament and my, my skill sets and my ways of dealing with stress and processing information and, and, and fulfilling some kind of obligation to a client or a customer uh, and myself, as it were. So I've, I've learned more about myself and what I'm capable of doing uh, and playing to my strengths since the world went digital. Isn't that interesting? How about that? Is that something That's, else? That is something else. And um, I, <laughs> I can totally see that, but I think I don't think that's unusual. I think many of us, particularly in our age range, um, were exposed mm-hmm. to this in such a different way. It made our world so much bigger so suddenly, mm-hmm. where I think other generations had the more subtle, gradual changes. Um, but our generation, it was like it went from you're isolated in a little town in Montana, and then all of a sudden you have access to the world. I mean, just during COVID, I got to be a guest lecturer for a school of engineers in India. Wow. That never would have happened from Helena, Montana 20 years ago when I moved here. So I, I don't think it's unusual for that particular shift in technology and in our global communication systems to have had that impact on us. I agree. And the learning has demonstrated that we are as effective or can be as effective in the virtual world as we could be in real life. Before I came to LinkedIn, which is the area in which I specialize, which is how I've been uh, carving out my livelihood since 2006, I was meandering around in business. I really didn't have a solid, crystallized notion of who I was as a professional. I, I had to learn that. Um, I, I had gotten a couple of graduate school degrees after I left medical school. I went back into the classroom and, and got a master's in industrial organizational psychology and then later an MBA. So I had great training behind me. I, I just was still not able to latch on with the company. And maybe I was convinced back then, Sarah, that I wasn't really a uh, good corporate timber. I, I didn't know if I would have survived in a corporate environment. It's very suffocating to an entrepreneur like me. I, I, I like the idea of, of going off unscripted and unregimented and, and doing things as I see them in, in the priority that I'd like to do them. Uh, you can't do that in the corporate world. You come in, here's what you've got to do before the end of the day, get it done. Oh, you need another day? All right, well, first thing tomorrow morning. So, I mean, those are the types of things that habitually drive people in 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 the corporate world. As an entrepreneur, we pressurize ourselves. We're our, under our own personal timelines to get things done. And I like that. I, I like the way that I've been able to set up my career, which I would have never had if not for for social media and the disruptive technologies that came down the pike in the early 2000s. So I'm a clear cut case of digital transformation and continuous adaptation and just gave myself up to the technology and and let that do things for me. I like that. I let it do things for me. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in absorbing whatever opportunities come and making a decision, a conscious opportunity decision, Mm -hmm. whether to take it. And um, I think too many people either take every opportunity and then they don't know what to do next, or they don't see the opportunities for some reason they have these blinders on. And so I think that's part of, um, part of that discovery of, of what your magic was and what you really do when I think about the story of 
my gradual transition from employee to self-employed, very gradual. I've always had that entrepreneurial desire. I've always like I I started a catering business when I was working full time in Washington D.C. and did all kinds of weird little side projects all yeah. along the way. But what I think about as far as that transition, what I mm-hmm. think about is the way that I learned how to present myself online, what my digital personal brand became, which I have to say wasn't intentional. Um, but I remember a specific moment when a blog post of mine was published. Um, I had reached out to Whitney Johnson, who wrote Disrupt Yourself and um, Building an A-Team, just amazing woman. I had read one of her blog posts that was a guest blogger, and I had been following Whitney Johnson's work. And I wrote her a note and said that I was kind of disappointed with this last blog post because it seemed like this woman who wrote it really came from a place of luxury. And I wasn't sure who Whitney's audience was that this story was going to be inspiring to them. But to somebody like me, it was kind of demotivating in a way. And I wasn't trying to be insulting, but I was like, I don't know what you're trying to do. But she said, she wrote back immediately. We've been friends ever since, but she wrote back immediately and said, well, what's your story? And up until that point, I had been writing stories about customer service because I thought that was going to be my thing. And I would write the story about an experience I had, and then I'd have lessons learned at the end. But it wasn't particularly personal. I mean, there were stories, but they weren't necessarily vulnerable stories. And she challenged me to write a personal story, personal blog post. So I wrote about um, uncovering a dream that I didn't know I had, which was singing in a rock band. I didn't even know that this was something that was on my radar until I started Mm -hmm. doing it. And it was a very vulnerable piece. And I remember this so vividly that as soon as it was published, I had that, like, my heart kind of constricted, couldn't breathe for a few seconds. I was like, what did I just do? And the response to that was overwhelming. People loved it. They loved Mm -hmm. the vulnerability. They loved the story. And that completely changed how I decided to present myself online. And that was the beginning of my transition into understanding what a personal brand could do for you, particularly on LinkedIn. So Agreed. What was yours? Agreed. You know, great story. And I'll take that a step further, dovetail on that by saying that we weren't really having conversations about personal branding or storytelling a decade ago. And we taped this here right on the precipice of, of the last day of 2020 and into 2021, storytelling, in my opinion, has become the new marketing. And the personal brand conversation has taken flight and, and may not come down. I, I think the our ability to see ourselves differently, especially through the COVID-19 lens, has driven business in unprecedented ways and has given us more license to do those types of things that you just talked about, and that is express ourselves uh, with greater vulnerability, uh, authenticity rolling in, uh, resilience, keywords that are great leadership traits uh, are the byproduct now of of a society that's just turning more external. We're we're not keeping things bottled up inside, especially on the on the web conferencing technologies like Zoom. We're we're much more authentic. We're we're living in fish bowls. People can see inside our houses now, which has been a great revelation for for some folks. But but I think we're we're gaining more ability to tell our stories without the immense pressure of having to become storytellers. Because if you listen to the marketers, yes, you should be telling your story. You should be a good steward of your story because now our stories are what truly differentiate us. That's how I started my TED Talk back in 2015. And maybe that was a little futuristic back then. But right now, with business being as hyper competitive and as crowded as it is, your story better be damn compelling or you don't stand a chance. You just won't break through. Right. And by story, We're not talking about the linear equation of your career. We're talking about specific instances that you can recall with great detail to bring somebody right into that moment with you to experience it next to you. And And can you leverage your story as a teaching moment, which is what what I would say. What what can people learn from what you went through? 
So what was your story in 2006 when you suddenly realized, oh, I, well, I should, I should say, I, I don't really believe in sudden moments like that. I really believe everything is more on a dimmer switch. But what was the, the story that you recall back in 2006 when that light switch came on full bright and you started going, oh my gosh, I have something here. This is meaningful. Actually, it was as quick as you've hinted at in your in your question. I, I I had been exposed to social media for a while before I accidentally, serendipitously leaned into LinkedIn. A couple of uh, colleagues of mine were uh, up in front of a laptop, and I leaned in and I said, "What are you guys looking at?" Oh, it's some social networking site called LinkedIn. And okay, so I kind of filed it. I went home that night, and this was during the holiday season, uh, right around now, uh, back in 2006. And I created my LinkedIn account that night, tinkered with the profile, got what I would call a, a, a profile up and running on the site. And, and I'm mid-stage early adoption here. So I'm at about the 22 million user mark of LinkedIn. So most of my inner circle and business wasn't even on the site. I started searching for them and I realized that I was coming up with nothing. I, I People who were close to me and professionally were just not aware of LinkedIn. So I literally, and I, I tell people this now, I, I became a LinkedIn consultant the moment I created my account because I never stopped advising people on it. I never shut up about it. I thought this was cool. I'm going to make this my own. And literally, that was the start of my own personal and professional transformation. I became this consultant, this specialist, uh, this advisor. I transitioned from my traditional marketing practice, which at the time, I was writing SEO website copy for businesses that were interested in getting to page one of Google in a search other than their name, which back then was a little bit more affordable. Now it's quite costly if you want to compete in certain keyword categories. So I just painted fresh. That was my canvas. And I, I created a new, it was content that didn't exist anywhere else. It wasn't on my website, wasn't on my bio or any other marketing collateral. It was fresh for LinkedIn. And it gave me this sense of, okay, in, in my vision, this could be the place where I would lead people to go who would learn about me and who would investigate my products and services and, and ideally be enticed to, to do business with me. And, and that's kind of held true. I haven't been visionary with all that much, Sarah, but I, I kind of hit on this. And a lot of things had to happen for me to have a career. And fortunately, they did. I created service offerings around what I do. And I was one of the first in the world that carved out a livelihood as a LinkedIn service provider which led me into Fortune 500 companies, uh, an appointment from my alma mater, the Illinois Institute of Technology, to teach social media marketing at the MBA level. So I was, I was awash with opportunity. And from it, I created an identity, something that I did not have prior to LinkedIn. So that was what happened gradually, though, was this well, understanding that you were carving this niche. It started as, this is LinkedIn. And then it became, this is what I do with LinkedIn. And then it became, this yeah. is what my magic is within LinkedIn. I mean, it sounds to me like I, I still, I'm still imagining you leaning over to see the monitor of your two colleagues and going, what's that? Like, That's I, exactly just, what happened. What I can't, I, you can't write that stuff. I, I literally was introduced to it that way. Now, of course, I would have come to it anyway, but I, but timing is everything. And I've learned that it's totally everything in, in the social media world. It's a time-sensitive proposition. Act and act quick. And you're right. It was a slow build, but I carved out large swaths of marketing and brand storytelling and thought leadership development through what I was doing and truly became a leader by example. So I answered a call of leadership that day, literally that day, in that moment. And I said, okay, this plays to my strengths. I'm going to get good at this. I'm going to be the smartest person in the room on this. And from that, it led to other things. Now, I've softened up a little bit, but I've never let down my guard. And I've always stayed true to my core values. And I've brought in my instincts as a healer because I truly approach what I do from the viewpoint of a healer because 
folks who retain me, the companies that retain me, they're in pain because they want to learn how this works. And I don't know. I just maybe see it differently. I bring my own overlay to it and I do it the way I think makes sense to me. And the feedback I've received is it makes sense to the people who are watching me. And that's a beautiful thing. That's what really crystallized it for me. I remember getting on LinkedIn pretty early on as a resume site. And um, I also remember when they first opened it up to other bloggers outside of the influencers like Richard Branson. Mm -hmm. And um, I applied to be one of the initial bloggers when you actually had to apply and get access to that yeah, LinkedIn publishing. Write an article. Yep. Yeah, the and homegrown remember, platform. Exactly. And I was on there for a couple of months before they opened up to the general public. And I, I remember just being blown away by the quality of writing from so many people around the world that weren't on the that high end of Richard Branson's influencing. And as a matter of fact, I remember pretty quickly totally losing interest in any of the articles written by so-called influencers. And diving far more deeply into the articles written by people like me. Yes. And I wanted to know what my network was doing. I, I wasn't really paying attention to the influencers. And when, when LinkedIn released their Pulse platform back in 2014, it was crowded right away. People loved it. And LinkedIn attached a lot of significance to it. So they would notify you when someone in your network published a post. I would like to see a restoration of that because I don't think we can really learn about our networks just by what they're putting down on the homepage. The homepage of LinkedIn now looks like the classified ad section of a newspaper. It's, it's just one overt self-promotion after another. And I that's know. okay. That's okay. No, I it's mean, not the, okay. <laughs> well, the platform is set up for overt self-promotion, but the discourse and the, the socially responsible behaviors are when we aggregate around content that really stirs us to something. Uh, learning about how cool people are or that they're guesting on this podcast or they're honored and delighted to be speaking at some conference that I'm not attending. I don't really care about that. I'm happy for them. It's support seeking behaviors that validate them. That's fine. But the real feeling of accomplishment that comes from leveraging a site like LinkedIn is that localized influence of maybe moving one person in their life to do something great and, or, or, or causing a, a tectonic shift in the way people think about certain things, or uh, in a period where our values are shifting because of a global pandemic anyway, is to really intersect with people where they live and cause them to just, again, think differently, uh, design thinking, more creativity, more improvisation, more creating something out of nothing. That's what really stirs the drink. I think that's the most disappointing aspect of where LinkedIn went for me is that lack of notifications for posts and um, mm -hmm. downplaying the articles and upgrading the status updates like Facebook. That was yep. that was a, a kicker for me. I almost left the platform when I started seeing that my feed was filled with advertisements, basically. And I, I just recently posted um, a self-promotion piece for the first time in I don't know how long. And let me tell you, it was like painful for me to hit post mm -hmm. on that one because um, when I started on LinkedIn and really was getting into the, um, the network aspect of really building a group of people that wanted to learn from each other and grow together and support each other. Mm -hmm. My friend Deb Helfrich and I co-wrote uh, an article, and we were talking about exactly that, that um, the gold of LinkedIn was in the comments. There would be these robust discussions under somebody's article, and you would just see people connecting dots all over the place. It was, it was extraordinary, the conversations that were happening in the comment sections of posts. And our co-written piece, the one we collaborated on, was uh, titled Big Hat, No Cattle. And it was all about the people who collect um, connections on LinkedIn, but don't mm -hmm. actually engage with them. And we talked, of, my part was about personalizing a connection request, which back then, all of a sudden, I was getting hundreds of connection requests just randomly. And then I'd never hear from the person again if I hit go. 
And um, I'm glad to say that I've seen a big shift in that in the last, I don't know, eight months or so, where almost all my connection requests have some form of a, a personal note. But the downside of that is that so many of them are trying to sell me something even before we connect or right after we connect, I get the whole sales message. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of people understanding how to really derive value from the platform. Yeah. And that's not a LinkedIn problem per se, Sarah, that's a LinkedIn user problem. And one thing we've learned, especially throughout this pandemic in the first 10 months of the pandemic is that there are a lot of bad actors out there. And these, these are folks that are coming from a place of survival and desperation. Uh, also, the proliferation of many of these spammy, predatory digital marketing platforms that just churn out tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of spammy invitations to connect based on scraping specific keywords in user profiles. It's what I call the ugly side of digital marketing. I, I find it offensive, intrusive, and annoying it's not the way I teach LinkedIn to individuals or companies. It's not an organic approach. It's just a numbers game, uh, a ratio piece. And to those folks who would enlist the services of these companies, I, I say shame on you because with all we're hearing about building trusted relationships and being authentic, this is about as non-authentic as it comes. The moment you take yourself out of the equation regarding anything on LinkedIn, it becomes automated. If you're bringing in a VA to, to answer your messages and, and you're at risk of losing so many potential opportunities that you could have cultivated if you only put your eyes on the site. And granted, there's a lot of junk out there. I'm the first person to tell you that there's a lot of crap out there, but we have to have our filters on and we have to sift through this sifter like the prospectors back at the Gold Rush of 49 did, where it might take a couple of sticking the sifter into the mud and shaking it out, but eventually there'll be a golden nugget in there. And we have our chat, our responsibility is to find that gold nugget because that's how we'll truly move the needle in our lives. It's not by churning these messages out to people who will never buy from us. It's, it's about forging inroads, building relationships, answering emails, returning phone calls, scheduling zoom meetings, that's what's going to drive it moving forward. Right. I always tell people that LinkedIn is just like anything else in life. You get out of it what you put into it. I'll go you one better there, young Sarah. Okay. I, I yes. will tell you. I will tell you that LinkedIn is like a lottery and you must be present to win. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like that too. So JD, when you think about one of the one of the key moments that you really felt satisfied with the work you were doing early on. Can you think of a particular client or a particular moment when you're on the platform or when you're with a client that you kind of went, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I talk about this in my upcoming book and I, from a storytelling approach, I will tell you, as I, when I turned the corner as a business speaker, I became a man in motion. I was speaking here, there and everywhere. But it was a different approach uh, early into my LinkedIn speaking career. I've been a speaker since my early 20s, where the organizer brought me in to speak to about 300 micro business owners at a beautiful rooftop ballroom in Chicago in the dead of winter. And I was all set to go, man. I had a great looking PowerPoint deck. I, I had my talking points. I was well rehearsed, getting ready to go out and speak to some very hip people. And she's getting ready to go out and introduce me. And she turns to me and she says, well, JD, I know you're going to educate people on LinkedIn. I know they're going to get a lot of value from this talk tonight. But what I'd like to have you do is just, you know, tell them a little bit about your story. Just, you know, kind of tell them who you are. Just, you know, what got you to the dance? What, what, what motivates you? Why you're here, et cetera. All those leading edge storytelling questions. And then she like literally walks away, goes up on stage to introduce me. And I'm sitting here. That was the last thing she said before I'm going on. And I'm in the, I'm in the zone, you know, the speaker zone. So I go out there. My, I was supposed to do like a 45 minute talk and about 10 or 15 minutes into the program. I just basically put down the remote 
and just free wheeled it. I didn't even go back to my slide deck. I just started to talk about truly what my point A to point B progression was and why I was there. What brought me here in front of you people tonight? And that was the most liberating, the most satisfying, and the most just personally gratifying piece of advice I got early into my career was from the organizer of an event who told me to just go out there and tell my story. I needed to have that told to me because again, my mindset was, okay, I'm this guy, I'm this figure. I have to educate people. They're counting on me. I've got to disperse this knowledge. I've got to be cool. I've got to be relatable, but you know what? Screw it. I had to go out and just tell people who I was. And that was right there. It was like the whole, the, 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 the seas parted, the veil was separated. I was lifted. The clouds lifted, the sun Absolutely. started shining. You know, I, I work a lot with people who want to be better speakers and just presenting more effectively. And one of the things I tell them is, whatever somebody can look up easily, can Google, shouldn't be in your presentation. Mm -hmm. You want to give them the inspiration to dig deeper. You don't need to tell them the things that they can look up. And one of my examples was when um, I would teach about being Jewish in Montana. Uh, I was always invited to the um, Carroll College. Their, they had an intro to religion and comparative religion courses. Mm -hmm. One was a freshman course and one was a junior or mm -hmm. upper level course. And in comparative religion, I expected the questions to be far more interesting than what I was getting from the freshmen. And every once in a while, I'd get a question like, what is the head covering and why do they wear it? I'm like, you could look that up. Why would you ask a person that question when you can look up something so, so simple? Ask sure. me about what it feels like to be Jewish in a town where there aren't very many Jews. Ask, mm -hmm. ask me what it was like growing up. So um, I love that that was the advice that you started to follow. It it opened everything up, right? Like. Everything oh, totally. after that changed. I was never the same speaker after that. And it, it was liberating in that I was able to inject more of my personality into every talk. I didn't, and it also led me to the realization that I didn't have to be all things for all people, that I, I was after a certain fit and a certain mentality of my audience or my ideal client where if they needed basic answers, I mean, you ask a basic question about LinkedIn, I mean, my gosh, there's hundreds of YouTube tutorial videos out there that, that could give you the answer that you need right away. But if you want to know the underlying motivations, intrinsic or extrinsic or behaviors or patterns or the social science around why it is that we do what we do, that was the niche that I wanted to drive. I wanted to be the smartest when it came to the, the psychology, the neuroscience, uh, how we improvise our way through the scenarios that we're faced with on a daily basis online. And now more than ever, the, the skills of applied improvisation, which I espouse and which I incorporate into my training are, are what really help people use the platform more effectively. It's not about knowing the tactics or the strategies. Yes, very important. You, you got to know what you're doing with the mouse, but at the same time, you've got to critically think your way through scenarios and situations, develop what I call, or what is called situational awareness, knowing who you are, uh, knowing what your limitations may be in a certain encounter, and also cutting people some slack because not everybody has knowledge. Uh, that's again, going back to the bad acting on LinkedIn. They're, they're selling uh, profusely on LinkedIn unceremoniously on LinkedIn because they don't know any better. They're, they're just doing what they feel they need to do. Oh, LinkedIn, license to sell. I'm going to go out there and ram my sales pitch down someone's throat. But truly, when you take that step back and realize that all a social network is, is a communication platform, it's a very complicated social or, or communication platform because it's one-to-one, one-to-many, to many many to one and many to many. So you've got four modes kind of ensconced in one, uh, one vehicle, you break it down and it's just people talking. And it's one mind trying to make an impact with another mind at one time. And 
it, the game slowed down for me and I got a chance to really glom on after that night. And I became a much more effective consultant, a much more engaging speaker because now I could be me. I didn't have to worry about being so stiff and rigid and, uh, and I could let more of my personality start to filter through. I love that story. I'm, I'm imagining you standing backstage with this woman. Do you remember what she looked like? Do you still have a visual of that whole of scenario? Course, of course. Of course. And she's standing in front of you. She's like, she basically throws a wrench right in your engine right there. And of course you were able to, to come out of it, but I can just imagine you standing there backstage yeah. going, wait, what? What does she mean? My story, my story. Why didn't you say didn't, that in the first place? <laughs> I didn't think anybody gave a rat's, you know what about my story at that point. It was, they were there to collect knowledge and I was there to transfer knowledge. And I had to, I had to kind of show them a thing or two. I felt that, you know, it goes back to childhood. You know, you got something to prove kid, prove it. Right. Here's your opportunity to go out there and prove it and educate these people. So that's, that's where I really was. And uh, you know what? I felt that Right then, I could leverage my own story as a teaching moment mm -hmm. and was able to show people that, you know what? Hey, man, I'm, I'm just like you. I, I came to social media unaware. It hit me like the same ton of bricks that it hit you with. And we're all in this together, figuring it out, sorting it out, uh, looking to get better, uh, become more effective business people. Uh, Do you remember more. coming off the stage when it ended? What yes. Like I, yes. I, I asked that because the thunderous applause. I'd like to tell you it was a standing <laughs> O, a ten minute standing ovation. Of course, but even uh -oh. better is when you step away and at least a few people come to talk to you afterward. That's always my gauge yes. whether yes. it was effective. So I'm, tell me about that. Well, I'm that speaker, Sarah. I'm the speaker that will, you know, and it's it's very flattering when people line up and they want that few minutes with you. And mm -hmm. I was that guy. If if I was bleeding into too much time, I would take people outside. I would make sure that I gave everybody time who wanted to ask me anything mm -hmm. and wanted a few minutes of FaceTime with me because that, I mean, my gosh, what what's more flattering as a professional speaker than that? But what it did was it took me back to the drafting board the very next day because I re-sculpted everything. I, I brought in new content. I brought in new avenues, new, I just, I basically let my, my eyes go into soft focus on everything and just let new ideas permeate. And they were coming in faster than I could capture them. And yeah, that was, that was a huge inflection point in my career, in my, in my life, because it, it altered my, my engagement dynamic to the point where, okay, you're going to get the real Un unabridged version, unapologetic version of me now. And if that means getting emotional on stage or dropping an F-bomb when I get very passionate about what I'm talking about, okay, that may happen. But you know what? It well, didn't happen like that. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I respect my audience, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but, but I think people at that point got the unfiltered truth for me. Mm -hmm. And that's all I've been doing since, since I started in business. I got a chill when you said that that first that next day when mm -hmm. you restructured everything based on a story and uh, you didn't say it in exactly those words but that's what I was picking up and that I love that image of you going into soft focus and picking out the relevant pieces I mean that to me um, I'm always a very visual person so hearing mm -hmm. you talk about it in that way reminds me of of so many people that don't realize the importance of doing that after they have that moment where they realize yeah. that everything changed yeah. and allowing themselves to, it, it's not that you're throwing away all the work you did before, but I love this idea of looking at it with soft focus so that you can, so the right things come into focus based on restructuring whatever you're doing to really look at what the story is behind it and bringing people into that because they're going to learn a lot more from you in terms of the value of LinkedIn or how to use it most appropriately, most effectively. They're going to learn it a lot more from you if they build absolutely. a connection with you. Uh, absolutely. And the key piece there is giving yourself the permission to do that and autonomy in your life to say, okay, it's not about taking 
some perspective I've had and just milking it for as long as I can. If, if you're not innovating around your thought processes, you're going to die. It's just not going to happen for you. The, the media are just too rapidly changing. And if you're going to move forward with the same slide deck year after year after year as a speaker, I mean, you're going to, it's the quickest way to send people scampering out of the room or, or to their phones and drowning you out. Right. So well, and I never, even I if I never wanted to be thought of that speaker right. that wants to, to drown out, you know. But even if they have never seen you speak, they see right through those repetitive things. Oh, yeah. And, and I think worse than that is that you yourself, even, no matter how much you love your material, it starts to come across as boredom. Um, I have a friend yeah. that I spoke to about this uh, probably two months ago. She was talking about her work, and I, I knew, because I know her, how inspired she is by the work she does. I mm-hmm. just know, because we've had great conversations. But when I overheard her telling a group of younger adults, younger professionals, the story of what she was doing, some of the clients that she was working with, she was kind of leaned back. Her At some point, she even put her elbow on the table and rested her chin on her hand and she just seemed bored. And I, I thought, I know she loves her work. So, <laughs> what, I mean, you have to really think about how your audience is going to perceive not just, just you and what you want them, you want the impact to be on, on this conversation and on these people around you, but thinking about how this story is playing out in her own head if she is giving this impression of being bored to others. Like, well, okay, so yeah. if Sty- I'm bored listening to you. <laughs> yeah, stylistically, you never want to go into a rut as a speaker. You, you truly don't. You want, you, don't, you want to move beyond each talk and create something fresh and original. Uh, maybe pass the content through a different lens or, or bring in a little bit less of something or take stuff out. And you're always upgrading, always refining, always enhancing the program. And, and that's what I do. I'm, I, I kind of consider myself like the grateful dead of professional speaking because no two talks are the same for me. Um, but hopefully as, they're not flat. Oh, oh, they never <laughs> are. I won't let it happen. And, and you know what, as a, as a speaker in the speaker world right now, and we realize this because now we're in a global pandemic and the, the professional speaking industry is in a medically induced coma right now. I, I mourn the loss of it every day that I'm not out in front of a live audience. I, I really feed off the audience. I really need that, that, that push I get from looking at the first couple rows and finding those warm, welcoming eyes that right. I keep coming back to. So mm-hmm. for me, it's okay. I'm in this virtual bubble now. Sometimes I'm at a webinar, I can't see who's online. I, I, I'm talking into a webcam and I'm ideally synchronizing my talk tracks to my slides and making a visual impact with people. And hopefully they're not checking email and they're really attuned to what I'm saying. So now our challenges as speakers are different, but the, the responsibility to the audience is to keep it fresh, keep it good, keep it thought provoking, uh, keep it valuable and make them want to talk to you when the talk is done. Well, I would say that that applies across the board. It doesn't matter if you're a public speaker or a supervisor in a medical office, um, Mm -hmm. or if you are a public sector worker at the DMV. I think the more you approach your life with that fresh outlook of being Mm -hmm. able to look at what you're doing in soft focus and then having the things that matter to you come into more sharp focus, um, and being able to be more intentional about bringing that to the people around you, no matter where you're sitting or speaking, as the case may be. True that. Uh, absolutely. Wow. And, and that's why speakers need to be coached as much as any other people in business. And it's mm-hmm. not about building a speaking business. It's about really making sure that you understand your responsibility as a speaker, an educator, uh, a value creator, an advisor a consultant speaking is, or or as a communicator Mm -hmm. for that point, mastering the communication arts. I mean, there's no more valuable skill right now to approach people from a place of service and altruism Mm -hmm. and benevolence and let them know that you think about them and that you care about them and that you really want them to receive this knowledge in a, in a, in the best possible way that you're dispensing. I love that. 
Absolutely. I, I'm looking forward to our listeners listening to that piece alone, that quote alone, because again, I, I, I think it just applies across the board to communication in our lives, whether we're talking to our kid or a friend or a potential client or a member of the serving public when you're at Starbucks or wherever you are, um, recognizing that you do have a role and responsibility in your community and presenting yourself in a way that's compassionate and listening mm -hmm. and non-judgmental, I think is going to be the key to our communities recovering from all of this. I would agree. I would agree. And, and every day we're shining light on people who have communication missteps and mishaps and literally implode their careers and implode their personal lives. Uh, I try to be as good a listener as I can at home. I try to be a very present husband and father and dog owner. And, and I'm really attuned to the, the subtleties of, of people when they ask me something. I try my best. I, I, I say yes to a lot more than I used to these days. And, mm -hmm. and I'm really, you know, more of that open guy that I've, I've always hoped that I would be. And a lot of that has come from a lot more self-assurance and mm -hmm. a lot more self-confidence and self-esteem and that I've gained through the years as someone who's been more public than ever before. I mean, prior to my LinkedIn career, I, I, w I was probably not the most gregarious guy around. I was, I, but I really found myself in the insular world of the, of the internet and, and just really, I mean, it brought a lot out of me. And I think that for all the, the bad rap that social media gets and that it does kind of de-alienate or it, it alienates us and kind of peripheralizes us a bit, it does bring us together and it helps us maintain a sense of connectedness that we would have never otherwise had. Do you think part of your um, transformation is also that you've become more intentional about how you want to be perceived, the legacy you want to leave behind? Most because definitely. That, that changed me a lot. When I started thinking about how my kids see me and my behavior, um, I remember one time I was talking badly about my boss. Um, it was hard time. The boss in, in question was... Um, pretty abusive, uh, but it, it was not a nice conversation the way that I was talking about him. And as we walked away, my husband said, you know, that really doesn't make you look good. <laughs> and I remember at first getting defensive, like, well, it's true. you know. <laughs> and then the other part of me was like, well, yeah, but sharing it like that doesn't make me feel better about myself. And as a matter of fact, as I walked away, I realized my kid probably overheard some of that. Mm -hmm. And that's not the person I want to be known as. And that was, that was a huge aha moment for me. Mm -hmm. And I think I was in my late thirties at that point. And I think it was, it's probably been, been in the last 12 years that I've taken that to an extreme where I really think about the impact of my behavior, my actions on the people in the world around me. And even though it's not always positive, it's far more intentional. Sure. Intentional is, is key. Um, serving with intention is key. And I mean, we all, we all want to be well-received in the eyes of our clients, our colleagues, our families, our audiences. Uh, as a speaker, sure. I, I'd like to be thought of as the, the presenter that knew his stuff. But you know what? I want to be known more as the guy who cared about his audience, who showed up ready, prepared, respected us, uh, talked with us, uh, not to us, that kind of thing. And as a, a communicator in other areas, sure, uh, bringing understanding and compassion and empathy. Gosh, empathy, my God, what a, you want to talk about a leadership trait that has, I mean, we, we've really learned the value of empathy over the last several years. And we're learning more about it now as we kind of skate into the second year of a pandemic. Uh, just meeting people where they live and understanding who they are. Every In, in business, we talk about client-centric behavior, client-centric writing, putting your, as you say, putting yourself in the shoes of your ideal client. What would they want? What would they expect from you? And the, I've always kind of felt that way. It, it's not about showing people how cool I am. 
hopefully that comes out, but it's not about that for me. Of course it uh, comes it's, out. <laughs> but it's about uh, truthfully believing in the strength of my solutions and hoping that what I provide or what I recommend will truly improve their lives and that they would have the sense to come back and let me know. There's so much, so many times, Sarah, I don't know the impact I'm making on people until they actually take the time to let me know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the case across the board. And I think that's part of why so often there is a disconnect between our actions and not being in an alignment with our values is because we don't get that instant feedback or the, Mm -hmm. the gratification of knowing that when we did something positive, it was noticed or appreciated. So I, I would, I would love to wrap this up with that idea for 2021 that we acknowledge when people have had an impact on us with a thank you, with a smile, with a post-it note on the desk of the Starbucks to thank the person at the register for their smile that day, um, to acknowledge those positive interactions that we have so that people do understand that their impact is felt. So it's not a disconnect. Yes. And that's for people who are struggling in business right now and who are really grappling with LinkedIn and Zoom and this feeling that they need a robust social media presence to compete uh, in their markets. You know what? Take a step back, relax, deep breath, and recalibrate, refresh, and come in with the idea in 2021 and beyond. I mean, anytime that you are making an impact and you are contributing. And when you believe that it shows up in all aspects of your life and business. And that's probably the biggest change with me is that I've been able to find what really drives me. Uh, And I wish my parents were around to see what had happened with LinkedIn. They were both gone before I discovered LinkedIn or became active in social media. And my father passed away before the internet was up and running. So, I mean, he would have loved this stuff. But but I think that's where we need to be right now is let's let the technology work advantageously for us. Uh, Don't harp on the mistakes people are making. I I never do that. I always let them believe that they're on the right track and and positively reinforce their behaviors and and let them know that, uh, you know, I'm not the voice of doom. I'm I'm the guiding light here. Here's what you you should be thinking or here's what you might want to consider next time type of approach. So Mm -hmm. I think that's where we kind of leave off is that the the instruments are only going to get better. They'll be more delicate. Uh, Personalities are very fragile right now. Uh, People don't want to be sold. People do not want to be thought of as your lead right now. So approach them from a place of service, start a conversation, build a relationship. Don't try to sell them a thing and then see where it goes. Agreed. Totally agree. Resoundingly. (laughs) I like Hmm. that a lot. I do not want to be known as a lead. And um, it's been pretty frustrating over the last six months or so with that. I know that I I have that written across my forehead right now, all across my LinkedIn profile, because I have the word coach in there. Isn't it amazing how many coaches want to sell you coaching programs that'll increase your income and get you more clients? I get at least probably 15 or 20 every week, those sales um, emails and messages. It's brutal. It is brutal. It is brutal. So um, before we log off, I'd love for you to share with our audience a little bit about um, what you do for them and where they can reach you when they want more information about your work. Well, that's very nice of you, Sarah. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Uh, One of the great joys, values, and blessings of doing podcasts is that you get to tell your story from different angles. And this is a pure storytelling podcast. And and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share the story. So thank you for having me. Thank you for extracting that out of me. Um, During COVID-19 times, I've made pivots within the pivot, and I've gone back to my LinkedIn roots. Uh, With so many people leaning into LinkedIn, some for the very first time, uh, they've either postponed or neglected their study of the site. Uh, I can truly support their goals and uh, work with them to get 
to gain clarity on their messaging and present well on the site. My services have remained the same since 2006. I just do them at a much more mature, refined level these days. And that, and they are LinkedIn profile writing and personal branding, LinkedIn individual coaching, LinkedIn corporate training. Uh, individuals and businesses that seek a greater understanding of LinkedIn, not the tutorial stuff that you see on YouTube, but really, mm -hmm. really doing an immersive piece in learning about themselves and finding their own niche and carving out an identity for themselves in the out, in the online world. That's where I truly support their goals. Excellent. And where can people reach you? I will have whatever links we talk about right now, I'll have them listed in the blog post associated with this podcast for easy access. And um, before I even end the sentence, I want to hear a little bit about your book and when it's going to be released. All right. Well, I'll, I'll get to that in, in due order. Um, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me under JD, no periods, Gershbein, G-E-R-S-H-B-E-I-N. JDGershbein.com. My company is Owlish Communications, like the owl, only the, adje the adjective version of the owl, Owlish. And um, the book is, is my own personal brand odyssey. It's a part memoir, part guidebook treatment of, of where I've been, uh, how the, the various junctures of my life have contributed to the, the nonlinear path that I've embraced. And, and, where I feel that we all should be heading in our own personal treatments of our personal brands and, and the way that we view ourselves in the online world. I, the, the clear understanding we have that people are just people, whether they're on a computer screen or two feet in front of you, I think that will go a long way and have far reaching implications in one's ability to develop new business and grow a profitable career and a satisfying career. And, and that's what I talk about in the book is how I've leveraged the things in my life to ideally uh, create and inspire teaching moments in the lives of others. That sounds great. And when is that coming out? When I finish it. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm trying to cough this book up like a cat trying to cough up a hairball at this oh, point. Oh, it's, it's, I know. It's lodged within my throat. Um, you know, it's coming. It's coming. I, 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 have, I have some accountability partners who are holding my feet to the fire on it. But uh, let's say for the here and now that we're looking at spring 2021. Excellent. Uh, and my, my only goal is that we can go out and speak publicly again so I can do a live speaking tour with the book. Oh, that would be awesome. Mine was released on May 31st of 2020. There so you go. Um, we did actually. Well, do. I'm going to come to Montana as part of my speaking tour. So. No, oh, well, I'll make but, sure you get a spot over here. Um, there you go. We d actually did do a live launch of my book. It was on the summit of a little hill next to the mountain that I climb all the time. Very so nice. So there were about 20 people out there. I had books. I had, I had plenty of space and wind blowing, and so it was safe. People wore masks when they got close, and it was actually pretty nice. It wasn't what I had anticipated when I wrote it, but it was, it was lovely nonetheless. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. I, I think that's what's kept a lot of authors from reaching their full potential is they can't go out and really promote their books. And I think as mm -hmm. a consequence, we're seeing a lot of that on LinkedIn. Uh, there are so many book releases on LinkedIn right now. Mm -hmm. And I feel that for me, it, it becomes a legacy piece back to your question. I, it, it validates me. Uh, I started writing the LinkedIn book, but realized that the medium was just changing too fast and I couldn't right. keep up. I, I didn't want to be the author that has to come out with a new edition every six months. Right. So I, I wanted to write something that I think will be as valuable down the road as it is now. Something a little more evergreen, yes. because I don't think the personal brand conversation is going to lose any steam anytime soon. Totally agree. Completely agree. JD, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for the generosity of your time and energy and story sharing in this last hour. I really appreciate you. Likewise. Very, nice, nice hanging out with you in, this, in your Zoom room. You keep a very clean Zoom room. <gasps> Thank you. Right. Um, for our listeners, there will be links to JD's LinkedIn profile so you can connect with him and follow him. And um, also one to his website, on the blog post associated with this podcast at elkinsconsulting.com. Thank you, J.D. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will. 
The book of the same title is now available, and the audiobook version will be released in November 2020. If you're ready to uncover your stories and learn to uncover the stories of the people around you to create stronger connections and healthier communities, visit elkinsconsulting.com. And while you're visiting the website, you can learn more about the book and the work we do to improve communication among teams and through our one-to-one coaching. Thank you. Could you tell me that you're going away?